Let's pray as we come before the word. Hallelujah. Father, we praise you and thank you for this beautiful opportunity you have given us. Thank you for helping us to worship you in truth and in spirit, Lord. Hallelujah. As we come before your precious word, Father, we pray, bless the word, Lord. Open our understanding. Help us to see our shortcomings, Lord, and help us to be strengthened in you. Open our understanding, enlighten our minds, Lord. We give you all glory and honor. In Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. I praise God for this beautiful time that God has given us. And for our meditation, let's turn to book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 10. Verse 10. Revel book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant. And of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Last week, we looked into this verse. And I believe the Lord is helping us to learn his word, word by word. Each word has been inspired by the Spirit of God. And here we read the last part, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Testimony of Jesus. That means prophecy. Prophecy is the spirit of God talking to man in a language that man can understand. There is a gift of tongues that needs interpretation. On the other hand, we have the gift of prophecy. The difference between the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy is, gift of tongues is also God speaking to man. And for that, the gift of interpretation is required so that there are people who might not accept the word of God when it is spoken in a language that they understand. That's why to give them a sign that what you are hearing is not man speaking, the gift of tongue operates with the gift of interpretation. But then when you look at the gift of prophecy, that's also God talking to man. Unknown tongues is man talking to God, gift of tongues is God talking to man. So when God is talking to man in a language that man understands, the spirit of, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That means, when God talks to man, Christ is being, uh, Christ is being raised, or that means, Christ is glorified. What does it mean Christ is glorified? In Christ we see Christ, God the Almighty. God manifested himself through Christ Jesus. So when it is when the gift of prophecy is operating, the central focus is that Christ be glorified. He should be uplifted, not man. Many a times when people prophesy, instead of glorifying Christ, Christ-like nature, man is being satisfied or he is being comforted. Some material things are being told. That's not the spirit of God working. That's another spirit or man spirit trying to confuse the believers. So always understand when the gift of prophecy is operating, the spirit of prophecy is or the whole essence of this gift is the testimony of Jesus. How 
God walked as man, set an example before mankind, and so that man is able to walk. Man is shown how he needs to walk, so that heaven is pleased through his life. Next, verse eleven. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. Last week also we read this verse. I just want to draw your attention to the first part. Heaven opened. What does that mean? What relevance does this word have in the book of Revelation, chapter nineteen? We we studied in the previous chapters about the great tribulation, chapter nineteen. We are coming. to the close of the great tribulation the millennium is about to start and before that we have the great armageddon war heaven opening up what does that mean we all know how god when he created man created him in his image and likeness god wanted man to know him and to walk according to his will but man chose to walk according to his own desires god allowed that to happen so that man comes to a realization as to who he is and how great his creator is but when man chose to walk on his own sin caught hold of him and since that day he is a slave of sin and satan is ruling over man and since the man is trying to walk but since he is a slave of sin he cannot walk as he wants to walk sin fulfills its desires its lust through man and we see how god did not give up on man gave him a time so that he can walk on his own see for himself that he is not able to walk and since he is a slave of sin and he cannot get deliverance on his own we see the grace of god manifested in bethlehem and on the cross heaven came down because god's righteousness needs to be fulfilled god cannot forgive sin god's justice demands that sin needs to be punished that's why in god's grace he comes down takes the form of man takes our place and he receives the judgment of the holy god upon himself so that man is delivered from that judgment he is saved from that judgment and then the door is open before man now we see christ hanging on the cross between two thieves what does that show one thief accepted that he is a sinner while the other mocked jesus this shows the whole world the whole world is divided among these two thieves one accepts his fault while the other mocks christ so those who accepted christ receive the promise receive the hope today you will be in paradise but those who mocked they are given a time to walk on their own what is the whole essence of the great tribulation man trying to walk on his own glorifying himself saying that i am god okay i am given you some time and now when heaven opens what does it show time is up O oh man your time is up i allowed i gave you the opportunity but now the time has come for you to see what heaven is how glorious heaven is you are thinking that you are god no sir there is a creator that's why heaven opens up in revelation chapter 19 heaven declares how glorious heaven is before man who tries to show that he himself is god and now we 
we read verse 11 behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true we read this portion christ descending on a horse and it say white horse that shows victory and the name that is that he is called is faithful and true what does that mean we have already read this portion in earlier chapters also christ is called the faithful take a moment what does that mean why is he called faithful many a times we when we face problems in our lives challenges in our life we are perplexed confused irritated and we are offended at god we question him why this is happening you need to understand how much it pains heaven how much it grieves heaven when you question the faithfulness of god he has led us this far each word that he has said is true the promises that he has given us are they not fulfilled then why are we questioning his faithfulness is it not something very serious the scripture says the just shall live by faith we have to just trust his word what he said accept it and that's it but when i have doubts i get worried and what should heaven do with someone who does not trust heaven though i call myself a believer a minister but if i don't trust his word what should heaven do with me he is not only faithful he is true that means christ shows or reveals the reality before us he reveals the reality of life and then in righteousness he doth judge and make war in righteousness he judges now what does that mean righteousness in righteousness he judges now when you look at the world state of affairs of the world today wars are going on an example russia russia ukraine war look at the ulterior motives of russia trying to take over the poorest nation in europe ukraine happens to be the poorest in europe and look at russia why are you trying to take over that nation what harm have they done you have already enough land why do you want to take over your neighboring country it's selfish motives now when this war is going on we see some countries are taking side of russia while some are taking side of ukraine countries are divided why because each nation has its own selfish motives they are not worried about others they are just concerned about themselves if you study the foreign policies of each nation it is full of selfishness nothing else so when man fights wars it is not in righteousness it's for selfish motives but when christ is coming he is judging in righteousness today when man judges it's not in righteousness it's just based on some evidences and the fact is many times the evidences don't tell the truth the court of the land goes by what the evidence says 
but many a times the evidence does not reveal the truth example the court in the hands of fortifor's wife in the court of the law the court is there and the court will say yes joseph is guilty the evidence is the court but is the evidence telling the truth it's far from the truth at times not always at times evidence doesn't tell the truth but the courts of human beings they go by evidence but god he judges in righteousness now what does in righteousness mean judges in righteousness heaven is not rushing towards judgment the time has come to judge the world the world has seen experienced the grace of god the world has experienced the mercy of god they have seen the love of god manifested on the cross and still they chose to walk on their own heaven is not rushing but the time is up man you had enough time now a time has come no more grace no more mercy now the time has come to be judged how many of us have seen the other side of christ christ the judge we are like a christ who is born in the manger who loves who heals the sick sick cares for the needy dies on the cross for the sinners who suffers in our place we are like such a jesus but how many of us will accept a jesus who judges the one hanging on the cross yes once he cried out father forgive them for they know not what they do but his second coming is not in bethlehem he is coming to judge in righteousness may the lord help us to go into the depth of those words to judge in righteousness not only that and make war the one who said show the other cheek the one who cried out from the cross forgive them for they know not what they do he is coming for a war with whom not with satan christ is not coming to fight with satan he is coming to coming for a war with man who has been created by god creator coming for a war with his creation may the lord help us the same creator once came to wrestle with john not to fight with john but to wrestle with him john did not recognize him initially but later on by the time he realized with whom he is wrestling it was too late he had started to limp the same god came and had food with abraham but here is not coming to hang on the cross is not coming to wrestle is not coming to sit and eat is coming to for a war with mankind look at the anger of heaven why i created you gave you the freedom for you to choose you need to learn that you cannot walk on your own time and again you have proved that you cannot walk on your own but still you don't want to surrender this creation is mine i created you and that great war of armagedon is about to start here verse 12 his eyes were like a flame of fire Now what does that mean we have already studied his searches are hearts 
Nothing is hidden from his eyesight. Nothing is hidden, sir. He sees everything. How can we hide our life from the one whose eyes are like a flame of fire? Let's surrender ourselves as we are. Humble ourselves. He searches our hearts. He knows our thoughts, our desires. As we were praying, I shared with you, may the Lord help us to search our hearts. Is everything that's therein, is it Christ-like? Is heaven pleased with my inner thoughts and my desires? Next. And on his head were many crowns. Not one crown, many crowns. And these crowns are the royal crowns. That means it shows that he is the king of kings and the lord of lords. King Charles is just a king of United Kingdom. And there are 196 countries. You are just king of one kingdom, sir. But the one who is coming on the white horse, he is the king of kings. Lord of Lords. He is the Sovereign. And then, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. The Spirit of God does not reveal the name that is written. It says only he knows the name that is written. What does that mean? Usually when I call my wife or my son or my daughter, when I call them by name, they know that they are being called. And they know who is calling them. That awareness is there. But here, this name is not revealed to anyone. What does that mean? This name shows the intimacy that father has with his son. It's an intimate relationship where no one else can enter. It is just between the two. That's why we are, we are called the sons of God, but we are not the only begotten. Christ is the only begotten. He is the one who was in the bosom of the Father. A relationship into which... No one else is allowed to enter in. That's what it means. That no man knew but he himself. Verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. His vesture dipped in blood. Was that, what does that mean? Some say it shows the blood that he shed on the cross. But here when you look at the whole picture, he is not coming to die on the cross again. This blood shows the war that he is fighting. The anger of heaven. In the battle of Armageddon, we have already studied how blood will flow up to the height of the horse's bridle. Look at the depth of this river of blood that will flow. It shows the fury of heaven against man. So if I choose to walk on my own, how does heaven look at me? If I fill my heart with thoughts and desires that brings glory to myself, what should heaven do with me? Here is vesture is sprinkled with the blood and, and his name is called the word of God. That means he is God himself. Word of God means God himself. When we are reading the word, we are hearing the voice of the creator. No one else. Verse 14 and the armies that were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now we look at the armies that are following Christ. 
they are not having any weapons with them while the armies that have gathered in armagedon they have come with their weapons their tanks their guns their other machineries their combat weapons they have come armed to their teeth but what is the weapon that the heavenly army is carrying they are clothed in fine linen white and clean that's the weapon of the army of heaven a child of god when he is persecuted the persecutors bring sticks sword stones and many other things but what is the weapon that the child of god uses to defend himself his closeness with god his work white linen fine linen white and clean his closeness with the almighty the intimate relationship that he has with god the love that he has for god is the only weapon that the church has now they are coming on white horses just like christ comes on the white horse shows he is victorious the church also has proved that it is victorious that's why they are allowed to sit on white horses they are not coming to to be victorious they are victorious that's why the church comes with christ during the second coming they come on white horses as christ also comes on a white horse verse 15 and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the almighty god so out of the mouth of christ comes a sharp sword and that sharp sword is the word of god that judges look at the power of god's word the power that's there in the name of jesus when we lay our hands on the sick or on the demon possessed or evil spirit possessed we just say in the name of jesus christ we don't realize how much power that is there in that name but you should ask the devil and he knows the power that is there in that name why is the world afraid of nuclear weapons because of the power that is released when the bomb will detonate the energy that will be released hiroshima nagasaki they have seen it so when that sharp two edged sword is used you can understand the power that will be released before which mankind will not be able to stand and in his anger and he should smite the nations with his power of his word he will smite the nations and then he shall rule with a rod of iron what does that mean he will remove all the all the world ru- ruling system and establishes heavenly system on this earth till now man uses his ideas to rule you should not think that once christ comes these same rulers will sit and continue with christian ideals no sir man's time to rule is over now heaven rules according to heaven standard that's why that iron rod that means now man doesn't have the option or the freedom to choose you have to obey your chance to choose is over sir that's why that iron rod you have to just obey what you are told to do and that's theocracy not democracy next and he treated the wine press of the fierceness and wrath of the almighty god look at the anger of heaven 
towards man at the end of the great tribulation verse 7 and uh, verse 16 and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written king of kings and lord of lords on his vesture and on his thigh thigh shows his strength he shows he is the king of kings not a prophet not a human being but the king of kings the lord of lords christ demands 100% submission today believers want a christ who loves a christ who cares christ who solves all their problems blesses them with material blessings last week also i shared with you how many of us are ready to accept the christ of the book of revelation the one who judges the one who is the king of kings the lord of lords verse 17 and i saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls and that fly in the midst of heaven come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great god now the angel is inviting all the birds for the great supper that i may eat that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men both free and enslaved both small and great so here the birds they are invited for the great supper why the great slaughter that takes place during armagedon immediately after that the millennium starts there's no time to bury these who have dead the great slaughter to clean up the land the birds are invited to feast on the bodies of kings captains mighty men horses and the bodies of them that is that sat on the horses next verse 19 and i saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army so now at the end the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies are gathered look at that sight they have come to fight to battle against christ and they have come with their armies and their latest weapons we have already studied about the battle of armagedon how fierce how gruesome it is the history of mankind has never seen a battle so gruesome and who is fighting the battle the one who hung on the cross naked he has come to war against man and he has come with his mighty angels and with his great army but he fights on his own verse 20 and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet and that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone look at the end of the great tribulation antichrist and the beast and the prophet the false prophet the beast stands for the antichrist and the false prophet they both are arrested they are the ones who are leading the battle they both are arrested taken into custody and delivered into the lake of fire 
They are the first ones who are going there alive. They are not put into the tormenting place to come before the white throne of judgment. They don't need to come there. They are already judged. They are cast right into the lake of fire. Even Mr. Satan is not there going there at that moment. He is put into the bottomless pit. But Antichrist and the prophet are there. They deceive the people. And verse 21, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So here in the closing we see that sight in Armageddon, that great battle. Here it says, all others who had taken the mark are slain, slaughtered. Their blood flows and the fowls were filled with their flesh. What a gruesome sight it is. Heaven invites the birds of the air to come. Chapter 19, how glorious this chapter is. In the beginning we see the marriage of the Lamb and His bridegroom, His bride. And at the closing we see the great Armageddon war and Antichrist and the false prophet in the lake of fire. Let's close our eyes, bow our head. Let's search our hearts. There are so many things that we have learned in this chapter. He is faithful and true. His eyes are flaming fire. Two-edged sword comes out from his mouth. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we praise you. We thank you. Heaven searches our heart also. Is heaven pleased with my life? Thank you, Jesus. The spirit, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. May the Lord bless us by these words. Before we close, let us pray. There are many people who have their needs. Some are sick. Some are facing issues and challenges in their life. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you for this beautiful opportunity that you have given us to come in your presence, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for helping us to worship you in truth and in spirit. And thank you, Lord, for speaking to us through your word. Search our hearts, Lord. Lord, burn away everything that's not Christ-like. Help us to lead a life that's pleasing unto you. Help us to get ready for your coming. Thank you, Lord. We give you all glory and honor. Lord, now we pray for those who are sick and those who are having problems in their lives. There are people who are bound by bad habits. In the name of Jesus Christ, we proclaim complete healing and deliverance. Satan, you have no right to bind the people. Sickness, you have no right over the people. In the name of Jesus Christ, we claim complete healing. We claim complete deliverance. Lord, glorify your name. Help each one of us to be strengthened in you and walk according to your word for your glory. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us till the coming of our Lord. Amen and amen. May God bless all of you. Our Lord is coming very soon. 
And just a notice to inform you, till now we were studying the book of Proverbs in our daily meditations. We'll be taking a break and uh, from tomorrow we'll be studying the importance of prayer. And God be willing, in the month of January, we'll continue the subject of the book of Proverbs and finish that book in our daily meditation. So this month we'll be focusing on prayer. So please uphold the ministry in your prayers and may God bless all of you. Our Lord is coming very soon. Maranatha.